Um, good morning, and thank you very much indeed to Indiri for the invitation to come and speak in Italy. It's only my second visit to Italy, and I must say it, it's really interesting to find out about um, the Italian school system and the, the changes that are going on um, in this country. <coughs> Now, for my presentation, I have two main aims. First of all, I want to provide a brief history, more history, of school improvement in the United Kingdom. But based on the concepts of collaboration and autonomy, and I'll say a bit more about those in a moment, and secondly, to discuss or to suggest some of the pros and cons of these different approaches, and to consider their potential applicability and relevance to other countries, such as the Italian system. Now, my argument is that in the history of UK school improvement, we've moved from collaboration to autonomy, back to collaboration, and since last week, we're possibly moving towards something else, which may resemble a new form of autonomy. Now, Collaboration, I'm talking about schools working together. So partnership, cooperation, collaboration, networks, those kinds of things. Autonomy, I'm talking about the school making its own decisions, its financial decisions, its decisions about employing teachers, its decisions about teaching subjects, and so on. And The, the history, really, is if you go back to the last century, the 20th century, we've had, of course, a Department of Education, a Ministry of Education, and the, the minister is called the Secretary of State for Education, and the most recently um, appointed Secretary of State is Nicky Morgan, who was previously uh, Minister of State before the election last week. But... From when schools were first set up, they were set up by charities and perhaps individuals, philanthropists, and to some extent churches. But it was hit and miss as to which towns and cities had schools. And then it was recognised that we needed some organisation, some coordination, so um, the concept of the local education authority um, was developed. And in 1902, over 100 years ago, local education authorities were set up. There are 152 of them, and they're a bit like English counties, which I think is smaller than an Italian region. So if you think of um, a county... Louder. Louder, um, So these were created in the 1902 Education Act. They still exist, but their powers have declined very considerably. And, of course, the third player is the schools themselves. And you'll be aware that we have primary schools and secondary schools, primary schools for age 5 to 11, and secondary schools for 11 to 16 or possibly 18. Now, the strongest aspect of this relationship previously has been between the LEAs and the schools. They worked very closely together. The funding went to the LEAs. LEAs had very considerable numbers of staff. They had specialist advisors who would advise on maths, history, English, geography, and, and so on. Now, since about 1988, mid-1980s, mid the power and influence of the local authorities has declined. However, I show this diagram from a 2000 report to show that even in the year 2000, local authorities had a good deal of influence because they had all of those functions. This was a report from the NFER research organization in the UK. And you probably can't see the detail, but basically there are six major functions on the right of that diagram about working with schools. And there are three major functions on the left of that diagram which shows that local authorities also work with adults and with early years children. So the point of that slide is that even in 2000, um, local authorities 
were very much involved with schools and had a, a, a big range of roles. Since that date, however, I would argue their position has declined very considerably. Their influence has declined. And a number of policies have encouraged increasing school autonomy, starting off with financial independence. And all of these are policies or programs which gave greater independence to schools and in some cases completely separated them from the local authority. So we have city technology colleges, the local management of schools, grant maintained status. We've always had faith in grammar schools who will work with the local authority but have a degree of independence in terms of selection of pupils and specialist schools program uh, where schools would specialise, for example, in maths, but would otherwise operate as a normal school. Now, the reason there's a line there is I think those are in the past, those ones uh, above the line, and those below are the main policies now, academies and free schools. More than half of secondary schools are now academies and they are completely independent from local authorities. They can decide the teacher's pay levels to some extent. They, they have to follow a national curriculum, but they can make adaptations to it, and they have financial independence. That, in turn, means that the Board of Governors, the governing body of the school, has become very important. And, and governors were concerned about this, and I said, you know, we... We need support if we're going to have these big responsibilities for schools. Free schools is a smaller program where anybody can set up their own school. They can make a proposal and they can be supported with government funding, not local funding, but central funding. And although there aren't that many at the moment, we're expecting the number to increase in the next few years. Now, even the last government recognised that there were challenges to autonomy. Um, that if you give schools independence, there are challenges to this. And this quotation is from Graham Stewart, who was and is a Conservative MP, who chaired the Education Committee of the House of Commons. And you can see several references in his quotation to school cooperation. So this is the very party in a coalition government encouraging school autonomy, acknowledging that you need cooperation too. So you have, um, they need to look at each other. Schools need to work with each other. We need a degree of coordination. We need to look beyond the school gate. Um, we do not want schools to operate in isolation. So the risk of autonomy is that you move towards isolation. And even the people putting in the policies for school autonomy are here acknowledging that we need collaboration and cooperation. So a big challenge to school autonomy developed probably over the last five to 10 years um, autonomy itself was driven by notions of parental choice and saying there's competition between schools. Schools are, um, you know, trying to attract pupils. In fact, in the most recent admissions process, 75% of parents got the first choice of school for their child, so they don't always get the best choice. Um, and there are three underlying issues, I think, that were behind the criticism of school autonomy. And what I say to any country that is considering giving more autonomy to its schools is you must consider these issues because they are important and they present challenges. The first is school accountability. If you separate a school from the local authority, who is it going to report to? The local authority used to set targets with the school. Now, a big part of the answer to that question is um, what Lee Northern just been talking about, that is Ofsted and the inspection system, which um, you know, monitors schools and evaluates schools and works with schools um, 
to, to, to bring about improvement. Another problem is central government direction because you've lost the local level. The Minister of Education became more powerful and although schools had autonomy, the Minister could say, here's the national curriculum that we want you to deliver. The Minister could say, here's the assessment system we'd like you to do assessment for learning. So some people felt that, that the Minister for Education was becoming too powerful, and it's called the middle tier argument. Do you need a middle tier between central government and schools at a local level? And the third question or issue, of course, is another very important one. It is, if you change the style of schooling, does it actually improve attainment? Does it actually achieve better outcomes for the pupils, which is what we're all looking for? This is the key to a school improvement conference such as this. Now, the evidence on that third question is limited, but there is a report from the National Foundation from educational, for Educational Research, where I used to work, the NFER, um, which says that if you look at value added of academies, the outcomes are mixed. Some academies are doing much better, but some academies are not doing so well in terms of adding value to pupils' attainment, and some have actually failed, and we've had a number of academy failures recently in England. So if you like, the jury is still out in terms of what will happen with academies. Just coming back to the question of school accountability, the OECD, the Organisation for Economic Cooperation and Development, in 2012, I believe it was, it was in my references, studied this across the PISA countries, the countries that take the PISA test, and they said it's a slightly complicated picture. If you give schools independence but not accountability, pupil results are not good. But if you give schools independence along with accountability, then in those countries, the results are better. So what it's suggesting to me is if you go fully down the autonomy role, you're probably not going to improve results. But if you have autonomy with collaboration and accountability, you are going to achieve better results. And I recommend that report from the OECD. It's in the references at the end of my presentation. Um, so what partnerships were put in place? What happened is the, the people who opposed school autonomy said, well, we need more partnerships. Best practice is not going to happen unless schools talk to each other. And I think that's been a fundamental principle uh, in the UK and in other countries over the, the last few years. So we tried a number of policies. You may have heard of Beacon Schools. They don't exist anymore, but they did um, about 10 or 12 years ago. Federations of schools, which are loosely connected, and you can even have one head teacher acting as the executive principal of three, four, or five schools in a federation. Excellence in cities was a policy that tried to improve standards in urban areas. London Challenge, my personal view is that by far the most successful of those policies listed there is London Challenge, because the results in London of children's outcomes in the last five, six, seven years have seen tremendous improvement, so much so that it has attracted international attention and people have visited London and have said, what is it about London that you've done to make it so successful. Now, that success hasn't been repeated across the UK. It has, it's been a bit patchy across the UK, but I'd certainly say that London Challenge was successful. City Challenge was an attempt to implement this in other cities, and then we had national leaders of education, local leaders of education, and specialist leaders of education who were particularly good teachers, advanced skills teachers, who would go around and advise on school improvement and recommend ways of bringing about improvement. We also now have national teaching schools 
who will group with other schools and provide placements for teacher trainees. And we have academy chains, so you don't just have one academy, you can have several academies run by the same organisation. So all of those are attempts at collaboration. A week ago today, a new government was elected, and we were all quite surprised because all the polls were saying we're going to have a hung parliament, something which you have experienced in Italy, of course. But in the end, the Conservatives, who had been part of the coalition government, won the election uh, with a few seats majority. So we expect them to push their new policies, well, build upon existing policies as well. And in the next five years, they have said they're going to produce 500 more free schools. Well, they're quite controversial because anybody can set one up. They have to go through certain tests and procedures, but you know, an individual or a charity or a group of people can, can offer to set up a free school. Um, they've also said there's going to be a challenge to coasting schools, and this links up with what Lee was talking about, I think, that Schools that need to improve are going to be challenged, and those that think they're doing okay, they used to think they were satisfactory, there's going to be more of an emphasis on those. Um, the majority of schools are good or outstanding, using Lee's um, inspection categories, but there is a proportion below, and the UK still has what we call a tale of underachievement. There are those pupils at the bottom, it's very difficult to shift their results. We've tried numerous policies to, to make things better for those pupils, and I think there will be more attention on that. But the biggest policy by far is academies, academisation. So your typical local authority has gone down from perhaps 100 people in size to something considerably less than that, a local education authority, it might be 15 or 20 people in some cases. They can no longer give subject advice. Uh, well, they, they can, but they, they can't really afford to employ specialist advisors. So the local authority role is a more general one to support and challenge their schools. But there are some local authorities and uh, Doncaster, which is near York in the north of England, now has no schools. It's, they've all become academies or free schools, and it has no secondary schools. So the role of the local authority has changed very considerably. Some people have said it will disappear, but they have been saying that for a number of years, so I'm not convinced the local authority will disappear, but it certainly has changed roles. And... Um, Professor Chris Husbands, who is the director of the Institute of Education at the University of London, wrote an article on this just a few days ago, and he's, he's trying to predict what will happen under the new government. And he actually talks about back to autonomy. He says, we're, we're going back to, to school autonomy. And he refers to a largely autonomous system of competing schools. Now that worries me a bit because I think the evidence says that collaboration and cooperation is extremely important. And if we go too far towards autonomy, you move towards isolation and you move towards difficulty. But interestingly, Chris Husband also says that England school system will look like few others in the world. So what you might want to do is to look and see what happens in England in the next five years, because he's suggesting that it looks very unique. It's almost an experiment in school autonomy, setting up schools individually, and to see what happens, to see if it improves results. So by way of moving towards a conclusion, my overall view on this is that what the evidence says, and I, I haven't been able to present the evidence in great detail, is that autonomy, pure autonomy, is negative and leads to isolation. A degree of autonomy is good, 
schools like to have a degree and make their own decisions. But you have to be very careful to get the balance right, that degree of autonomy. And collaboration or cooperation or networking or partnership in just about every study I've seen, it says provided the collaboration is meaningful, it will help to raise standards. So I'm under no doubt at all that provided collaboration and cooperation is properly enacted and supported and with commitment from all the parties, then partnership works very well. And I, I visited so many schools in England and I think the one thing that I can say about successful schools is that they are outward looking. They are willing to talk to other people. They are always self-evaluating. They're saying we're pleased with what we do, we like our achievements, but we can always improve. And that's where the self-evaluation cycle comes in. And you look at other schools, and I've seen some fantastic partnership working. Sometimes it involves new technologies, sometimes it involves particular subjects, but the schools uh, undoubtedly are benefiting from these partnerships. So I end by making a request to change the title of my presentation from one week ago, from collaboration, autonomy, collaboration, to collaboration, autonomy, collaboration, autonomy. And recognizing that the nature of these things changes as we go along. So we have collaboration mark one, collaboration mark two, autonomy mark one, autonomy mark two. Thank you very much indeed for your time and attention.